morning, and grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. It's in his name that we welcome you to worship this morning at First Presbyterian. We are excited that you are here, and a special welcome to y'all, you all who are uh, visiting with us this morning. We hope that you'll find your time uh, of our fellowship suite and the worship God glorifying as we commit ourselves to the worship of the Lord on this Lord's Day. Uh, we know that our Lord will bring success uh, through the ordinary means. His word will be read, his word will be preached, we will pray, we will sing, we will fellowship with one another, and we know that the Lord has promised that he would do a good work in that, uh, that he will save sinners and he will encourage and sanctify believers. And so we are coming with much anticipation for what, what the Lord might do as well. We know that we never leave this place the same way in which we came. Uh, we see all throughout the scriptures, those who meet with a living God are changed forever. Uh, and so we look forward to the good work that he will do here amongst us. Uh, before we enter into worship and even prepare our hearts for worship, uh, I want to draw your attention to a few announcements there on the back of your bulletin on page 8. Uh, of course, all of them are important. We are asking that you be mindful of your contributions to the church. We are reminding you that uh, Pastor Don is teaching a catechism class for our children uh, on Wednesday nights, beginning at 5.15, before our fellowship meal. Uh, and he has a good little group meeting with him. And so if you would like your child to be a part of that, uh, please uh, let Pastor Don know. Also, we've been letting you know for the past number of weeks now that we will have uh, officer elections on November the 3rd, immediately after our morning worship service. And you see those men who have been nominated both to the office of elder and deacon. And those are the numbers that we need to... Uh, fill our open slots of our rotating system uh, and so we have two elders and four deacons um, and uh, so be prepared for that congregational meeting on November 3rd. Uh, also uh, looking at uh, some women's Bible study news our morning circle is going to be starting back and so you see that our morning circle is going to meet Tuesday morning at 10 a.m. Uh, here in the ladies parlor and then that evening circle is going to meet uh, Monday, October 14th at 6 p.m. Uh, and so please make plans to attend uh, one of those uh, ladies as they start this new study uh, together. And then uh, if you're with us here in Sunday school, you heard from one of our visiting missionaries, uh, Reverend Aaron Halbert. Uh, Aaron will be preaching for us this evening at 6 p.m. And so we hope that you'll make special plans to return and worship with us again to book into our Lord's Day in worship. But also, uh, it's a great privilege, we've uh, Zoomed, uh, had a Zoom call with Aaron on a Wednesday night, and then about three years ago, Aaron was here and did a Sunday school lesson and preached for us during the morning worship service, but it actually iced that weekend. Uh, we had a heavy ice. I, I love telling the story. Aaron comes, you know, coming down the stairs uh, in his uh, pajamas and goes, you, we don't have church when it ices here, right? We're in the South. And I said, no, we're still having church. Let's go. You need to get dressed. Um, and so we had church here, but of course, due to the weather, uh, things were slim. But it's especially uh, really exciting to have his family here with us, his wife Rachel, his five children, Ford, Catherine, Waverly, Whitley, and Riley. Um, and so uh, if you have not met this wonderful family uh, that we support, their work down in uh, Honduras through Mission to the World, uh, please make special plans to do so as you uh, leave here after worship this morning. Well, that concludes our announcements for now. Let us take a brief moment as the choir sings to uh, prepare our hearts to meet the living God together.
calls us to worship in his word. And so we look to Psalm 119, uh, selected verses in the last stanza of this song that David writes regarding the word of God. So if you'll please stand as you're able and let us enter into worship together. Let my voice come before you, O Lord, and give me understanding according to your word. My lips will pour forth praise, for you teach me your law. My tongue will sing of your word and all of your commandments, for they are right, and your hand will always be ready to help me, for I have chosen your precepts before you. I have gone astray like a lost sheep, but you seek your servant, for I do not forget your commandments. Well, as a people of God that's gathered here to worship the Lord who has sought us out even in our sinfulness and brought us to a right understanding of who he is and how to live for his glory, let us uh, take our hymn books in our hands and turn over to uh, our first uh, psalm, a psalm of praise, 148b, hallelujah, praise Jehovah, let us sing together. Let's pray. Our Father, our God, 
our one God and three persons. Lord, we come to you through Christ by the power of the Spirit. And Lord, we uh, exclaim what we just sang. Uh, reality, truth, is that you are glorious, that you are exalted, Lord, that we don't even have words that can uh, describe who you truly are uh, that would uh, in any way exhaust or meet uh, the reality of it. But Lord, we know that you are good, we know you're faithful, we know you're worthy of our trust, you're worthy of our praise, Uh, we know that you are God and you are good and we are thankful for that in a world that seems chaotic and marred by sin, including our own, Lord. Uh, We come this morning to praise you. Father, we pray you'd give us all we need to praise you this morning. We pray you'd be uh, with all of us, that your spirit would work in our hearts, Lord. Help us to listen, to think about the words we say, uh, that your word would be planted deeply uh, in our hearts, that it work in us, Lord. And Father, we pray that uh, your spirit would help Pastor Matt to preach and, and all of us, Lord, to, to hear your word as what it truly is, the word of God. Uh, so, Father, we uh, have confidence in these things because we ask in Christ's name and we ask as your children by your doing. And, Lord, we now come together, uh, praying together that prayer that you taught the disciples to pray, praying. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, if you'd remain standing and uh, just take your hymn book again and turn to hymn 429, a hymn 429, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing, again, as we pray for the Lord's blessing this morning and, and in our lives. Uh, again, please remain standing and let's sing hymn 429. <laughs> seated. Well, as we uh, come to this time of the reading of God's Word, I'd invite you, if you have a Bible, to uh, take it out. And uh, again, if you'd uh, like to use a pew Bible in the pew rack in front of you, the blue ones, you'll find our reading in Psalm 26 uh, this morning on page 583. So page 583, uh, looking at Psalm 26. 
as we uh, about to look at this, this psalm uh, of David, we're going to notice that David is, is really uh, looking at his, his walk before the Lord. There's a lot of similarities between Psalm 26 and Psalm 1, and we'll see that David, in fact, is, is, uh, seems to be almost self-righteous in a sense. I don't want to say it in a bad way, but he's saying, Lord, look at how I've done these things. It can seem self-righteous, but David is really saying, what you've told me to do, I have done, and I'm continuing to do that. And uh, I think that we can, can go and pray uh, that we've uh, been faithful to the Lord in certain ways as well. But we remember we're, we're reading about David. And if you, we've read the Bible at all, we know that David uh, is a sinner and a man who fell into some great sin, a man who is after God's own heart, but a man who committed horrendous sin. And so are we. And we realize uh, this, this psalm really is only fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, he's the only one who can say this psalm all the time perfectly. Uh, so this psalm should not uh, cause us to dis- despair uh, when we realize that we do not keep these things, but to turn to Christ, but also uh, by his grace to seek to walk uh, in uh, his statutes as well. So again, uh, Psalm 26, let's ask the Lord for his blessing and then uh, we'll read it. Uh, Lord, your word is uh, your word is profitable for all things, Lord, uh, for building us up, for rebuke, Lord, and for certain for turning us to Christ as well, uh, to uh, realize and see our own sin uh, in the mirror of your word, and to repent and to rejoice that we are not our own saviors. So again, we pray you'd bless this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Hear God's word from Psalm 26 of David. Vindicate me, O Lord, for I have walked in my integrity, and I have trusted in the Lord without wavering. Prove me, O Lord, and try me. Test my heart and my mind, for your steadfast love is before my eyes, and I walk in your faithfulness. I do not sit with men of falsehood, nor do I consort with hypocrites. I hate the assembly of evildoers, and I will not sit with the wicked. I wash my hands in innocence and go around your altar, O Lord, proclaiming thanksgiving aloud and telling all your wondrous deeds. O Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. Do not sweep my soul away with sinners, nor my life with bloodthirsty men in whose hands are evil devices and whose right hands are full of bribes. But as for me, I shall walk in my integrity Redeem me and be gracious to me. My foot stands on level ground. In the great assembly, I will bless the Lord. Well, thus far, God's holy word, would he again write its truths upon our hearts for us. Well, as we uh, continue in our worship service, we now come to the time of the giving, uh, where we worship our Lord uh, through tithes and offerings, and the giving of what God has blessed us with. So, deacons, if you'd come forward. Uh, Let us be faithful to worship the Lord now in uh, our giving.
Let's pray. <clears throat> Lord, we, um, Lord, you are good in uh, innumerable ways, and Lord, of course, as was just sung in beholding the Lamb, sending your Son to be the sacrificial Lamb of God for us sinners, that you might uh, forgive us and make us your people. Um, Lord, we thank you for all things. We thank you for uh, the gifts you give us uh, and the gift of being able to um, to uh, support the church in her work and to uh, worship in this way. So we, we pray these gifts would be used for your glory, Lord, and for your purposes. And we ask you to set them aside for those things. And we ask this all in Christ's name. Amen. Please be seated. Well, as you are sitting, I would invite you to take out your Bibles and turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2, our selected text for this morning is verses 13 through 17. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 13 through 17. And as you're turning there, if there are children who need to be dismissed for Children's Church, uh, you can be dismissed at the back, but also I'm going to give a moment for the choir to join us in the congregation for the preaching of God's Word. Well, as we turn our attention to 1 Peter chapter 2, uh, we are closing our time in this series that has been going on for 19 weeks, even though we broke for the summer to study the Psalms, where we have been applying God's Word to our life. We have talked about many different things. I actually was talking with this with Samuel and Aaron last night as we were uh, watching uh, some football, that we've handled all sorts of things, contentment, grief sickness, pain, we've talked about anxiety and depression, we've talked about the church and our role in the church, we've talked about how to be parents and husbands and wives, and we have really been trying to establish how the Bible, in fact, gives us a worldview of every situation and circumstance and every sphere of influence that we find ourselves in. You know, it's, it's the duty of the Christian to see our world in light of the Bible. We believe, as we started this series back 19 weeks ago, that we believe that there is a sufficiency in the Word of God, that God's Word is the only rule for faith and practice, that as we live out the lives of Christians, either as husbands and wives or fathers and mothers, this morning we will hear about being members of a civil sphere of a society, that God's Word is the dominant force in how we are to do these things, how we are to navigate something as polarizing as politics. And, and I understand, as Pastor Don and myself were walking through the hallway uh, to come into the sanctuary for worship, you know, I feel like I've picked the most polarizing topic to close our time in on. And, and I'll tell, tell you why. I'm a little bit, as I stand here before you, in a lose-lose situation because how polarizing politics has become and how chaotic and unstable our society has become, there will be those in the congregation this morning who will think that I said too much. And there will be some in the congregation who will think that I didn't say enough. And it's a lose-lose situation for us as a people if we're not guided and guarded in our thinking according to the scriptures. In fact, the Apostle Peter has much to say 
about what it means to be a citizen in a kingdom, a citizen of a country, and primarily what he will fall back to, the gospel truth is, yes, we might be citizens of the United States of America, but ultimately, and most importantly, and where our, our allegiance lies fully and solely, is in the kingdom of Christ. And so, you know, regardless of your uh, political convictions this morning, you, you'll probably have an opinion of something that is said, just to put that out there before we even get started. And I'll be happy to talk to you about these things uh, after the service, if you uh, feel so led to do so. Uh, but, you know, in, in this society, in this country in which we live, where we've moved from a positive Christian world to a neutral Christian world to a negative Christian world here in America. It has become even more polarizing to be a Christian where it used to be that it was a benefit to you as a politician to be a professed believer in Christ now is a hindrance to you. Where it used to be that businessmen and women would flock into the churches as they moved into new towns to build relationships. Now, it seems as if they neglect those things. And even in this post-Christian society in which we live, the Apostle Paul speaks boldly uh, to our circumstances and tells us best how to live. And so before we read the text again, verses 13 through 17, let me pray for right understanding of God's word, uh, and then we'll dive in together. Father in heaven, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And Lord, we confess before you that we are so often slow to look at the world and look at our society through the lenses of Scripture. We think that worldly powers and political pundits have the right answers on how best to glorify you in the way that we conduct ourselves in this civil sphere. And yet, Lord, we know that your word teaches us how to best glorify you and enjoy you forever. And so, Lord, may we not put our trust in any earthly power or princes, but let us know that even the rulers of this age will one day bow before the King of kings and the Lord of lords, Jesus, as he returns on the clouds of glory to establish the new heavens and the new earth. Let that be our mindset as we consider how Christians are to navigate politics in this polarizing age. And Lord, we need more of your spirit to give us that understanding. And so, Lord, we ask that you would give your spirit to us in abundance so that we might have ears to hear, minds to understand, hearts ready to receive. May we not check out according to our political agendas that we hold to personally, but let us search our hearts. And may we see where we're in error. And so use this word to convict where conviction is needed. And let us use this word to see where we are walking in the truth of holiness. And so use this word to encourage where encouragement is needed. And we pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Again, reading verses 13 through 17. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to the governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God. That by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of the foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the emperor. Well, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God remains forever and ever. Well, uh, as I was reading commentaries this week on this very topic and uh, on this pericope of the Lord's Word, 
Uh, I found that many of the commentators use something of alliteration as they all seemingly gave us three predominant points that are found in these uh, handful of verses with three words that start with the letter A. The Apostle Peter talks about our attitude towards the civil sphere. Also, the Apostle Peter talks about our approach to the civil sphere. And then our agenda in the civil sphere. And so that's how I want to uh, walk through the text this morning, uh, you know, standing on the shoulders of giants, men who are much wiser than I, talking about our attitude towards the civil sphere, our approach to the civil sphere, and then our agenda in the civil sphere. And so, as we begin to think about this text, I was reminded because I have been reading uh, the letters of Samuel Rutherford yet again in my devotional time, and he spoke of the, the day in 1596 where one of his dear friends, Andrew Melville, had a single audience of King James VI, the King of Scotland, because the reformers of the day were worried that his political policies were now bringing hindrance to the advancement of the gospel. And as they began to talk about these things, they began to talk about the Reformation and the ideologies of the Reformation that we will actually study in detail on Reformation Sunday during our Reformation hymn sing that we do each and every year. As they talked about sola scriptura and sola fide and sola gratia and sola deo gloria and all these principles of the Reformation, Melville began to talk to the king about his political theology. And he began to talk about how his policies were hindering the advancement of God's kingdom here on earth. And finally, Melville, courageous, yes, but admittedly losing his patience with the king, sucks his teeth. We know how that works. You do that little and goes, you're God's silly vassal. And then he begins to talk about how there is a kingdom that overarches any kingdom of this world. And he told the king, King James VI, you might consider yourself the king of Scotland, and by God's providence you have been placed upon the throne, but I will tell you of a greater king who is building his kingdom despite your political policies and despite your political opposition. And of course, that is King Jesus. And we know something of this throughout the Bible where men like Daniel were captive in a pagan society there in Babylon, and he was a good citizen of the kingdom, actually working his way into the advanced rankings of the wisest of wise leaders of the day. And yet... When it came time to stand for the gospel, he never feared, and he never compromised, and he was quick to remind King Nebuchadnezzar, by God's hand have you ascended to power, and by God's hand will you be brought low. And we know how that worked for King Nebuchadnezzar. He finds himself still the king, but essentially acting like an animal in the fields, eating the slop with the livestock. You see, it's God's sovereignty that is the overarching theme of what Peter writes in 1 Peter chapter 2. Because what Peter has done already in this book is he has talked about general theological principles, and now as he begins to apply it very specifically to the believers in this civil sphere, according to civil government, being citizens of these earthly powers, what he is now applying to daily life is the big theological strokes in which he has painted already in this letter. And one of those has been God's sovereignty. And one of those has also been how we are sojourners, strangers in this fallen land. That we cannot put our hope in princes and emperors or civil governments, but that we must have a hope in Jesus that surpasses all of those things because he is the King of kings, and he is the Lord of lords. And that influences the way that he first talks about this attitude that we have to the civil government. It's there for us in verse 13. He tells us that we are to be subject for the Lord's sake 
to every human institution. And so we must first understand that what Peter calls the civil government is this earthly, is this human institution. As Christians, we belong to this world. We are in this world. And yet the call for Christians is that we are not of this world, correct? That we are citizens of Dillon, that we are citizens of the state of South Carolina, that we are citizens of the United States of America, and and, and there are governments locally, state, federal, that God has sovereignly put in place for the good of his people, as we'll talk about here in just a few moments. But he says that this institution, this government, is an earthly institution. It's a human institution. What Peter's trying to get to here is that it's the opposite of Christ's kingdom. That is a spiritual institution. And so you think about those words of Melville, or you think about those words of Daniel, and you think about what is the message that's trying to be communicated to these earthly powers. And it's simply, you are so small in comparison to the glory and the kingship of Christ. I mean, you think about that. Wouldn't that really put you in your place? I mean, we've been considering how it is to be husbands and wives and fathers and mothers and, and the men. I saw you men. You walked out those doors beating your chest and says, I am the king of my household, right? And you think, well, you're the king of three people, four people. Daniel stands before Nebuchadnezzar, the king of millions. And Melville stands before King James the Sixth in Scotland, king of millions, and says, your power and your authority is just a small speck of human history in comparison to the eternal weight of glory that is the kingship of Christ. And we, we cannot have an overinflated view of the civil sphere. That's the first thing that Peter wants you to understand. We, we get so captivated by the political leanings of our day and the political debates, which, quite frankly, aren't very good. And, and we get so captivated in all these things that our anxiety jumps up or our blood pressure jumps up or it influences our mood for the entire day or week that has consumed our lives as the election of president is coming closer and closer and closer every facebook post we like and every twitter post that we view it is it, all about politics it's become such an idol for us in today's society and peter wants you to understand even the united states of america and all of its civil sphere as great of a story as it is it's just a small speck in the redemptive history that belongs to the Lord and Savior Jesus. It cannot become an idol for our hearts. It cannot be an institution that controls our moods or enables us to battle with things like anxiety and depression. Yes, we are to be subject to these institutions because God has put us in such a time as this. But you notice even that he tells us to be subject to these human institutions for the Lord's sake. The Apostle Peter is adamant that Christ is in the highest view even in the ways that we conduct ourselves in this political regime. As we cast our ballots, as we serve in civil offices. All of those things are right and good for citizens. In fact, I think our world would be a better place if real devoted Christians would commit themselves to involvement in the civil spheres. But, but we do it all for the sake of Christ. Don't you see that in verse 13? Whether it be an emperor whether it be some sort of supreme king or queen or monarch, 
whether it be some governor, something like our republic here in the United States of America, or the parliament in the United Kingdom, whatever it might be, we give our subjection to them for the Lord's sake, for the glory of Christ. And even as we consider this, this attitude, not only do we have to understand that it's a human institution sitting under the sovereignty of God, but in fact, these political pundits or these politicians or these governments, these human institutions were sent by God for a purpose. They were raised up to power for a purpose. And you see that at the end of verse 14. They are to punish those who do evil and praise those who do good. They're here to execute justice, is what we might say, to put it very simply. Now, when our politicians and our political governments, when, when these institutions are not doing the will of God as they were called to do, uh, it is right and it is good to pray those imprecatory psalms that the Lord would remove them. That the Lord would establish a government that would bring honor and glory to his name. That would work for the good of the people who would execute justice on his behalf. That is his design for human government. But you notice that Peter doesn't give those qualifications, does he? I mean, you think about the, the season of life that Peter writes to this church. They are under the leadership of the Emperor Nero. We know that Christians under Nero were highly persecuted, slandered. We know that Nero actually used, and this is kind of graphic, but he would literally take Christians into captivity, dip them into wax, put them on a stake, and light them afire so that they would be light for his parties in his empire. And yet... The Apostle Peter says, be subject to them to the glory of Christ. And your mind is blown. My mind's blown at least. What in the world is Peter talking about? How could he call us to a subjection to an evil emperor like Nero? To a society, to a government who calls what God says is good evil. And what God says is evil, good. How, how could he do such a thing? Well, he tells us very simply that we are to live for Christ's glory simply because we belong to his kingdom. We belong first and predominantly to his kingdom. Yes, we're citizens of earthly rulers and powers, but our minds should be so captivated by the glory of Christ and obedience unto him, that we would live in such a way that even is subjective, honoring, he says at the end of this short text, honoring to those who might even persecute us. Isn't that what the Lord Jesus tells his disciples there in the upper room? Do not be surprised when the world hates you. They hated me first. Don't be surprised when suffering abounds in the Christian life. I suffered on your behalf. Just as I will suffer, you will suffer, he says. And it's because we are not of this world. That's something that Peter's already said to us in this letter. If we were to study it from the first chapter to the very end of the book, he keeps reminding us that we are aliens, sojourners in a strange land. And, and in this traveling to the land of promise, of heaven, of the real and eternal kingdom, with the real king, Jesus, who reigns, we are to live first as citizens of his kingdom. And that means no matter how perverted the civil government might look, we treat them as if they were abiding in Christ. We honor them as if they were bringing glory to Christ because in his sovereignty, he has an established a government to work out the good of those who will do good and to serve justice against those who will do evil. I understand this, 
this commandment is, is, is hard for us to grasp. When, when things like lawsuits are being filed against Christians for, for not baking cakes for homosexual weddings, and they are being persecuted for, for that cause, I know it's hard to say, I am going to honor this government. And yet that's the call, isn't it? Without qualification, the call is, fear God, honor the emperor. And, and so that's actually the approach that the Apostle Peter calls us to maintain here in the civil sphere. He tells us the approach in, our, in this civil sphere for Christians is to love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. Essentially what he's telling us is, to love God and love neighbor. To be the best citizen that we can absolutely be in subjection to this human institution for the glory of Christ. It's, it's actually not a complex command. It, 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 it causes us a lot of angst because, simply put, it's hard to honor something that we see as so polarizing and so chaotic. But what he's calling us to do here is to live for God's glory to the betterment of our neighbor. You see, when, when our first priority is to live for the glory of Christ, that will influence the way that we conduct ourselves with our neighbors. And if we're living to the glory of Christ, who has established all things, who has told us the best way to live this life and to flourish in this God-given life that he has allowed us to live, it will benefit those around us. Just as we were talking about how good male headship in the home is a benefit to the wife and children, good Christian believers being prominent members of society, loving God, loving neighbor, is a benefit to the society around us. You know, we, we often pray that the Lord would make us a city on a hill, a, a, a light that is not hidden under a basket, but but a light to let the whole community to see that Christ is in us. It's a benefit, isn't it, to the world around us. The way in which we, as Christians, are subject to these human institutions, to the glory of Christ, will be a benefit to those in this civil sphere alongside of us. He actually says that we should live in such a way, in verse 15, where we are loving the brotherhood, fearing God, and honoring the emperor. He tells us that we should do this so much so that those who are against us wouldn't have anything negative to say about us. When's the last time that we prayed for our civil government? When is the last time that we openly and publicly, no matter our political leanings, honored the civil institution that God has established and the leaders that he has put there with our words, with our actions? You see, what the Apostle Peter is calling us to do is no matter how frustrating the political landscape might be and no matter how evil and perverted it might seem, and surely... In this post-Christian society in America, it is evil and it is perverted. But the call is still to love God and allow that to now drive us to honor the emperor. You know, one of the things that captivates me about this in this approach to how we live in the civil sphere, he, he tells us at the very beginning to love the brotherhood. Why, why would he bring in the church in, in his talking about how to live in the civil sphere is, I think it's simply because he knows that we're going to need one another. That we're going to need one another. We, we are going to be, and I think increasingly so, I, I've taught you all about this, I think that the church will become brighter and brighter, the church will always increase, always be bearing fruit, but I think it will be brighter for, for the same reason that the world's getting darker. I think the Lord is going to build his church up and, and produce fruit through his church and bring men and women and children unto himself through the, through the ministry of the church. But I also think that 
A, a Romans 1 experience is happening within our nation. We have turned so far away from God and His commandments that He is going to just hand us over as a nation. Unless He intervenes with revival. We pray for revival all the time. We're going to keep praying for revival. But the way it seems now, the Lord's just going to hand us over to these desires of our flesh. And so society, brothers and sisters, I think will get darker and darker and darker. And we need one another in the household of faith so that we might be strengthened, so that we might endure, so that we might sharpen one another, so that we might become brighter and brighter and brighter. You see, the, the, the simple thing here is, uh, if we were sitting in a dark room, one commentator said, and you lit one birthday candle and walked into the dark places, it wouldn't be much light. But if you walked in with a birthday cake full of 55, 60 candles, the whole room could see. We, we need to be an established people together so that we might reveal the brightness of Christ into this lost and dying world. And the way in which we do that is that we love one another, we fear God, and we honor the emperor, the apostle Peter says. And, and I understand the you know, I understand the temptation. You know, when we think about the civil sphere and we think about fearing the Lord, there's really two reactions that we could take. Either we could become something like the monks in the monasteries and we can say this world is so, you know, so defiled by sin, I'm going to kind of hunker in to my home and, and, and I'm just not going to interact with the world outside of my my stead, that's monasticism, that's the out, outlook of the monks, and, and I'll tell you how that practically plays out today, I was actually talking to a young man this past week, and he was really struggling with having more children, they have one, they have one covenant child, and I said, when's the second coming, because that's naturally the next question, uh, if you have one, you have two, uh, and that's, uh, everybody's going to ask you when you're going to add to another, um, and so I asked that ordinary question, and he goes, you know what, we're committed not to have any more children. We just can't stomach bringing a child into this sort of society. You've heard that, I'm sure. That's an outlook of monasticism. I'm going to pull so far out of this world that I'm just not going to be a part of it. And, and and the Apostle Peter says we cannot use our freedom in Christ as a cover-up for evil. I think that is one way in which we will do that. We're called to be in the world. We're called to be citizens of kingdoms and governments. We're called to be living for Christ's glory in these places that he has placed us. So we cannot draw back, nor can we compromise. Nor can we compromise. You think about the Apostle Peter as, as he writes this letter, this is the same man who has stood before the Sanhedrin in Jerusalem, the same Sanhedrin that has put the Lord to death. And he says, I know what you want me to do. You want me to stop preaching Christ. But I can only do what the Lord has commanded me to do, and I must still preach. Do what you must, but I will not be silenced. It, it's a no compromising position. It's not a dishonoring position, but it's a no compromising position. And so we can't retreat into the world, nor can we become those who are of the world. We cannot compromise. There was a, a dangerous uh, missionary movement that, that the PCA had to debate many years ago called the Insider Movement. And what was happening is all of these Muslims in the Middle East were coming to Christ. And because they would not be persecuted, because they would not be slandered, because they would not be put to death, these missionaries were telling these new converts from Islam to Christianity just to go through the daily rituals of being a Muslim. Go to the temples and pray. You know, do your fasts. Do, do everything that a Muslim would do. But just secretly be a Christian. We cannot pull ourselves out of the world, nor can we look like the world. You know, we're not called to be a part of a glorified, Americanized insider movement. 
when the Lord tells us something very particular in His Word, we cannot compromise because His truth, His Word, has created a firm foundation for all of life and practice, all that we might believe and uphold. And so, so we honor the emperor, yes, but we obey him as far as the word of God will allow us to. You see, if our government ever calls us to go against what our Lord has said to do, we are to simply refuse. We don't have to grandstand. We don't have to protest. You just go and you live the faithful life of a Christian. Isn't that what Daniel did? If you think about Daniel in, in the kingdom of Babylon, I know at that point it had turned into the kingdom of Syria under the king Cyrus. But you think about him in this pagan country. And the commandment is held, you know, is held by the political government of this day. No one is to pray before any king or any god other than the king. Excuse me. What does he do? Does he pitch a fit? Does he burn down the city? No, he just simply goes home and commits his life to the Lord. He prays. He prays as God has called him to pray. And so we honor the emperor, yes. And sometimes the greatest honor of the emperor that we can perform is our faithful duty to the Lord. And, and here's why. Because the government, the civil sphere, will have to answer for the ways in which they live. If they are servants of God, as Paul says in Romans chapter 13, they will answer for every time that they have went against his law went against his will, did not ex execute justice, did not praise good. And so, just as the command for us to honor our leaders in the church in Hebrews 13, because they will be ones who will answer before the Lord on the day of judgment, we are also to honor those in authority over us in the civil sphere. And the agenda that we pursue is the glory of Christ, is the advancement of his kingdom, Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. We live this way so that we might show honor and respect, sometimes to even dishonorable men and women in authority. But we live in this way to the glory and praise of God. And that is our primary allegiance. And so no matter how chaotic it might seem, no matter who wins the election in a few weeks, the call of the Christian is still the same. Love the church. Fear God. Honor those who he has put in power and authority over us. So we pray for them. We honor them. But we stand firmly upon the word of God. Because the way in which we navigate politics is through a biblical worldview. We do not let political pundits teach us how to live or think. We are captivated, body, soul, mind, with the Scripture because he teaches us how to glorify him and enjoy him forever, which is the chiefest end of man. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we do thank you for the opportunity to come to your word. And Lord, we know uh, that these are hard lessons for us, especially in a polarizing political year in the midst of polarizing elections. Lord, may we uh, seek your word and how best to execute our duties as citizens. May we be active even in the civil sphere, Lord, to bring glory to your name and to advance your kingdom. That is our agenda, we might say. We hear so much about political agendas. Our agenda is to glorify you and enjoy you forever. And so let us act in a way that our enemies cannot say a negative thing about us because we love God. And we love neighbor. And even when, Lord, loving God and loving neighbor as we ought brings about persecution, let us count it a joy for it shows that we are united to Christ. And so, Lord, may we be strong and courageous. May we be firmly planted upon the scriptures. And may we seek out your wisdom in your revealed will, which is our Bible day by day so that we best know how to sojourn 
how to travel, how to pilgrim through this sin-filled land, being faithful to you all the way to glory. In Christ's name we pray these things. Amen. Well, uh, if you'll open your hymn books to 515, 515, uh, we're going to sing together uh, More Than Conquerors, 515, More Than Conquerors, and, uh, and we'll sing all five verses together, and so let's stand and sing aloud. Let me remind you that uh, Pastor Aaron will be preaching for us this evening at 6. We hope that you'll join us for a time in God's Word yet again as we close our Lord's Day in public worship. Also, let me uh, draw your attention to our congregational response, which is the glory of pottery that we'll sing immediately after the benediction. And now, people of God, receive the blessing of our Lord. Peace to all of you who are in Christ, now until we reach glory. Amen. Thank you.